Hello, good morning, and welcome to Nature Live Online from the Natural History Museum. I'm Khalil Thurloway. While the museum stores may have finally reopened to visitors, we still want to make sure the museum is as safe as possible for everyone. So for the time being, we'll still be hosting these shows online rather than in our studio at the museum. We've put in a load of measures to make sure you can have a fun and safe time at the museum, and you can find out more information on our website. Today, we're going to be chatting about mosquitoes. You might think we know all about mosquitoes, blood-sucking little beasties that spread diseases, but there's much more to these little insects than meets the eye. To help me get past the surface, I've got Lorna Culperwell, who studies mosquitoes here at the museum. Hi Lorna, thanks for joining us. Hi Gunnar, thank you for being here. Um, we'd love to hear from you guys at home as well, so if you've got any questions today, please do pop them in the comments section and we'll try to answer as many as we can in the time we've got. So Lorna, before we get into the, uh, the nitty gritty of the lives of mosquitoes, why don't you give us a bit of an introduction into who you are and what you do at the museum? So I'm a PhD student between the Natural History Museum and the University of Helsinki in Finland. And my PhD project is all about mosquitoes in Finland. So first of all, wanting to know which mosquitoes are present, where they're present across the, fin the country of Finland. And then after that, we're trying to look at markers, DNA markers, to try and create a library of DNA to try and then so other scientists can compare their sequences to, and also looking at the viruses that mosquitoes transmit. And what made you want to study mosquitoes? Why wouldn't you want to study mosquitoes? Mosquitoes are fascinating. So I got a job at the museum um, a few years ago before I started my PhD, looking at the, the relationships between one group of mosquitoes. And I found them so interesting that I thought I wanted to pursue this further. And that's nothing aside from the fact that these are also very important mosquito uh, creatures uh, in terms of disease, both of human and of uh, animals. So they're very important creatures and we should really find out all we can about them. And we've got some pictures here of you out in the field, doing your best Lara Croft impersonation on the right with the um, mosquito catching noises. Um, and I think also, we've also got some pictures of some, some quite diverse examples of what mosquitoes can look like because you know, we might think of them as these tiny little whiny, uh, dark kind of buzzing insects, but actually they can come in all sorts of, all sorts of different forms. And they can be very beautiful and they can have lots of different roles in the ecosystem. Um, so when we get a picture of that, that picture, we'll kind of chat about some of these. Yeah. So mosquitoes, we always think of them as just that horrible little brown speck that's just that annoying, uh, uh, annoying noise that accompanies them and then suddenly we've got a little welt on our hand where they've bitten us and they're very annoying. But actually, when you start looking at them, especially tropical species, they can be far more than just the annoying buzz. They can actually be very beautiful as well. So while there are little boring brown jobs as well, and there are lots of them, there are also some fabulous colours that mosquitoes can have. And actually, they can rival butterflies, in my opinion. Perhaps not quite the same. I don't think a lepto lepidopterist would agree, but I think it could. Yeah, I guess, do, what, do, uh, do you get in many arguments with lepidopterists about what's more beautiful? Butterflies? <laughs> None to date, but you never know. <laughs> so uh, why don't we start off with a little bit of the basic biology of, of mosquitoes. We're all coming from the same kind of base level of So uh, where can we find mosquitoes? Is so mosquitoes can be found anywhere in the world except for Antarctica. I mean, they really are found absolutely everywhere. And basically, they have to have water. That is the thing that they breed in. So as long as there is water in the environment in some capacity, whether it's uh, water standing in a tire or whether it's a stream or something like that, if there's water, there is the potential for mosquitoes. But they also need something to feed on. So if there's no other life, then they're obviously not going to be there. So I guess if you're one of those people who uh, always gets bitten by mosquitoes, then Antarctica is your ideal holiday destination. Yes, or Iceland, because there are no mosquitoes native to Iceland. Um, and we've actually we've already getting some questions in from the audience. Um, and uh, some, one of our viewers has asked, and this is kind of relevant to what we're talking about, uh, why do mosquitoes target some people rather than others? Well, that's a very um, personal vendetta asked question. <laughs> no, I think... All of us uh, have got chemicals which we're giving off from our skin at any one time. And the mosquitoes are attracted to the compounds in those chemicals that they're giving off. So some of them just happen to like other compounds more than others. So some people have got better, better smell to mosquitoes. I guess it's like wearing a perfume. If you've got one that smells good, people are going to go towards you. But if you smell like manure, then perhaps they might avoid you. Um, 
And so why do mosquitoes feed on blood? So it's a really simple thing that mosquitoes need protein to complete their life cycle. So generally, uh, most mosquito larvae will filter feed when they're larvae. So they just take in particulate matter from the water where they're, where they're breeding or they're, they're developing. And so they don't get enough protein in their meal. So they need to then supplement their protein to be able to develop eggs. And our blood is a rich source of protein and that's why they need it. So, uh, and so it becomes the nutrients from our blood are what they need to get that really important stage of their life cycle. Uh, so, uh, I, oh, sorry, I missed that. We should, we I didn't hear what you said. Oh, sorry, we should be getting to that slide soon. Um, so the, 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 the life cycle, they, they, you said they filter feed as young and then it's, it's only the adults that really need that blood meal, that protein, to yes. The, uh, you can see there's a lovely mosquito here, which has got a lovely belly full of blood, and that will be then used to develop her eggs. And, uh, and so the, the larvae, you said they filter feed, so the larvae live in the water, correct? Yes. They can be any different water, like I say, it's stagnant or slow moving. Generally, you don't find them in very fast moving water because otherwise they'll just get washed away. But uh, so the adult will lay their eggs on or near to water. So this one example of a clump of eggs being laid on the water, but they can also be laid above the water, just above the water level. Those eggs then hatch and they go through four different larval instars. So each of them broadly look the same. Uh, they, they're missing from the slide there, two of them, but um, uh, they, <laughs> they worked earlier. Mm. The larvae <laughs> look Sorry, the same. Sorry, I'm issues with our PowerPoint. <laughs> yeah, it seems that way. So the larvae, the four stages, there's two missing there, um, but they were there earlier. They develop through, and then at the fourth larval end star, they shed their larval skin. So that's what the blue representation there is. It's the old larval skin. And then they pupate. So they then turn into this pupil form. And the pupil form doesn't eat. And that's when they're changing their body form from this larval filter feeding form to this adult blood feeding form. Or it's not blood feeding for males. They don't feed on blood. So they feed on track plant juices. Um, so then the adult will hatch from the pupil skin and then the cycle can start again. Um, and it's this, uh, it's this blood feeding that the adult females do, that uh, that's what gives them the kind of reputation for transmitting viral and parasitic diseases, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's very important for us to know about these things as well. So it's a consequence of them eating blood, drinking blood, is that as they take in blood from a host, whether it's a human or another animal, um, some of those hosts that they're drinking from will be infected with something, be it malaria or be it a virus or be it a little microfilarial parasite, a little worm. Uh, the mosquitoes can take that into their body with the blood meal. Then there's a replication phase inside the mosquito. Then eventually, once it's had enough time, the virus or parasite will go up to the proboscis of the mosquito. That's the drinking part that we think of. Uh, and then that can be ejected into the, the next host that they then feed on the next time that they have a blood meal. Um, and we've got a question from uh, one of our viewers on Facebook uh, who's asking whether whether all mosquitoes feed on blood. No, not at all, actually. There's a group of mosquitoes called Topsorhynchites, it's a genus. There's 90 different species there, and they don't feed on blood at all um, because they have a slightly different life strategy. So they have the larval feed, the larval stage is the same as, as we see in this slide. But instead of filter feeding, their mouths are developed so that they can bite and grab onto other mosquito larvae or other larvae that are inhabiting the water that they're in. So they're actually really good guys because they can be mosquito predators, actually, and they can reduce the numbers of bad species in the same container system. And so I guess instead of being vegetarian when they're babies and vampires when they're older, they're predators when they're young and they get lots of protein from that. And so when they're adults, they don't need to feed on blood. Is that right? That's precisely it. So they've had enough protein that they've in their larval form so that they don't need to then feed on protein in their adult form. And it's actually really good because they can get really big as well because they've had that protein early on. Whereas the other species tend to be smaller because they haven't had so much protein. Um, so yeah, the biggest Toxorhynchites that I know of, I think with his wingspan out is about two and a half centimeters ish. And I think length of body, it's about two centimeters or just shy of two centimeters. So they're quite big, but they're completely harmless and very colorful and lovely. I think I think we have a, an image of that in our slide deck. If we can get yep. some of these technical issues. Um, this one, yes, they're absolutely beautiful. 
Yeah, they're stunning. So they're very easily recognized from other mosquito genera because if you look, they've got a proboscis that turns down at 90 degrees. That's what you see going towards the scale bar at the bottom. That's the proboscis. So they would proboscis is that kind of uh, their long pointy mouth parts. Exactly, yes. So that uh, is very, very characteristic. Only the Toxorhynchites have them, the mouth parts going like that. They also have these lovely scale tufts at the bottom of the abdomen. You can see here that they've got these reds and oranges. Unfortunately, the colors haven't been as true as they are in real life, but they are so vibrantly beautiful. And yeah, so you can see here, yes, you can see here that um, these are the scales from the end of the abdomen. That you've got these fabulous reds and yellows and purples, and I think these could rival butterfly scales. In my opinion, is is this kind of arrangement of scales and hairs? Uh, is that one way that we can tell different types of mosquito apart? Yeah, so if you look here, the scales are the flattened ones that kind of look like they've got lines going through them. And the CT are hair-like structures, so they're the long, thin ones. Now, across the body as a whole, you can then look at the patterns of scales and CTs, and they can be used to try and help distinguish species as adults. How else can we tell different species of mosquito apart? Because I guess it must be quite important to know whether that thing flying into your room is going to be biting you or whether it's a kind of benign flower feeding type? Absolutely. Well, the first and an easy way of looking at mosquitoes, whether they're going to be potentially an Anopheles and therefore potential malaria vector, depending on which part of the planet you're on, or something else, is the resting position. Now, the, unfortunately, the mosquito here, which should be resting at its lovely 45 degree angle, is not as its usual position. But you can see the top right, that's an Anopheles mosquito. Normally, they rest with their head down against the ground and their abdomen up, and they would normally be at around about 45 degrees from the surface. They do vary a little bit, as you can see from this image. The other ones you can see in this slide, the, they are all the other subfamily, Chilisinae. They tend to sit so that their head is more parallel to the surface and perhaps their abdomen face points down. So that's a nice way of, of seeing which one's which. So that there's a broad subfamily split. But then we use the scales and the CT and everything else uh, if we actually want to know which species it is. And that one on the top left seems to have kind of almost fingery things coming off the front of its proboscis. What's that? Yeah, so that's actually a male mosquito. So we don't tend to bother with them so much necessarily because as a, as a general public person, because they don't bother us. They don't eat blood. They just eat plant juices. They don't need blood. So they tend to leave us alone. But they have these lovely plumose antennae. So those CT I mentioned, those hair-like structures, they cover the antennae and they're, they're sensory. They also have these maxillary palp from yours which come away from the proboscis as well. The females have them too, but the males have them much more elongated in some species. So that's what you can see. So it looks like there's three different structures coming from the proboscis. So one of that is the proboscis, and two are the maxillary pulp Well, uh, Yeah, I think it's, it's mad that we don't normally get such a close look at these little organisms. Normally you just see them kind of flying past and you take a swat at them. Um, and we've had a question from, um, from one of our viewers, Michael, who's asking, uh, what is it that makes that whining sound as they fly around your room at night? So it's the speed at which they beat their wings. So as far as I understand it, uh, every time the mosquito beats its wing, that's considered to be one hertz. And so they can beat their wings at a frequency at least 400 hertz. So that's 400 times per second. And some of them more, some of them less. And it's that that causes the, the sound that we hear. Um, and while, while we're answering some uh, viewer questions, uh, We've had a, I had a question, another question from YouTube asking whether any mosquitoes have any kind of venom or poison or anything. So mosquitoes are not venomous or poisonous. They bite. They don't have a stinger like you would see in the hymenopterus or the bees and the wasps. So they just bite. So no poison, no venom, nothing like that. The only problem that they have for us is that when they feed, uh, so they're using their mouth parts, they inject saliva into the body of the host which they're feeding from. And that is full of anticoagulants. So that stops the blood from <laughs> clotting around the proboscis and preventing the mosquito to be able to remove her head. So that's what they're injecting. Nothing else, no poisons. Um, and how can, and we've had quite a few uh, viewers actually asking, how can we prevent ourselves from being bitten? Because I guess the mosquitoes must seek out their, their victims or their prey uh, in using certain cues. Absolutely. So, like I said, there's compounds that we give off on our skin and they, they're attracted to those. 
We also give off carbon dioxide out of our breath, and it's the pulses of that carbon dioxide that they're attracted to. And then there's our body heat. So there's a combination of different things that they're looking for. And really, if you want to prevent being bitten, the best way is to practice good dress sense and good sense about closing windows in tropical countries or making sure that there's mosquito screens on, on nets or on the windows so that they don't come indoors. And generally, if you're going to be out at dusk or around dusk and early night, make sure you've got long sleeves and long trousers, because especially in tropical countries, they like biting around ankles and feet. So it's also good to wear shoes. But I realize in hot countries, you don't always necessarily want to do that. So that's why it's important also to have various repellents and really important to take the, the prescriptions that doctors give you when you go to tropical countries as well for preventing malaria and preventing other the injections to prevent other diseases from developing. There, there are various kind of remedies that are touted to kind of uh, maybe kind of repel mosquitoes if you eat lots of garlic or if you eat a hot curry or if you take certain vitamins. Do any of those have any basis in science? Not that I'm aware of. If you can imagine being really, really hungry, if there was a hamburger sitting on the table and it tasted a little bit off, would you just ignore it or would you eat it anyway <laughs> because you're hungry? So it's kind of looking at it like that. So some of them might for some species of mosquito because there's, there's 3,578 uh, currently recognized mosquito species in the world. So as a few of those at least are going to ignore these things. So. Okay, so for now, let's get, let's get back to the, uh, the main thrust of the talk and we can come back to some more questions later. So we've had a look at how, how we can visually tell the difference between some of the adults of the different species. What about the larvae? Because they, they look totally different from the adults. Yeah, so I said that there's two subfamilies of mosquitoes. There, I don't know if I named them, but there's the Anopheline, which contains Anopheles and a couple of other genera, and then there's the Culicinae, which kind of holds everything else. So there's a lot in that genus. Uh, there's a lot in that subfamily. There's two examples here from the Culicinae, the subfamily Culicinae. What you can see is uh, they've got the heads pointing down in the water, so that the heads down the bottom. Then they've got the thorax, and then they've got the abdomen, and then at the end of the abdomen, they've got this little structure pointing up. And that is called a siphon. And at the end of the siphon, there is a little hole called a spiracle, and they can rest that against the surface of water, and break the surface tension, and then they can breathe. And that's how they breathe. Um, so that's how you tell subfamily Culicinae from subfamily Anopheles. So you can see it really obviously here because you've got a lovely Culex teratans on the left, and he's got that lovely long thin siphon. So that's the breathing tube against the water surface. Uh, and then you've got that contrasted against Anopheles which doesn't have that same structure. It still has the spiracle, the hole at the end of the abdomen, but it doesn't have the siphon that supports it. So what they do is instead they sit against the surface of the water. So it's almost like a reversal of the adults. So whereas the adults of Anopheles normally sit with their head down uh, when they're on the surface and their, their abdomen is up, in the water they sit pretty much flat to the surface. And it's the same that instead of being flat to the surface as an adult, if you listen, they tend to be abdomen up. So it's the opposite way around. There is actually a third strategy, uh, which is one tribe of mosquitoes the Mantinione has. They've got completely modified siphons, and I find them amazing. But there's no pictures of them here because I've, I've, my larva that I've managed to, to grow up this year is still too small to get them. They have adapted their breathing tube to become a spike. And what they do is instead of going to the surface of the water, they stab their spike into plants, into the air spaces of plants, and they can breathe in the air spaces on roots of plants. So they can stay in there many centimeters down in the water and they just stay there and develop onto there until they're ready to come up. It's amazing the variety of strategies that closely related species have come up with to solve the same problem. Yeah, absolutely. They're, when you start looking into mosquitoes, they're a very fascinating little world. And we can't, we don't just use um, morphology and their, their physical characteristics to tell the difference between different mosquitoes. We also use their DNA, don't we? Yes, we do. So there's some species, this one here on the right is an Anopheles species. There's some complexes of species which morphologically, if you, so if you look at the structure of the mosquito itself, they look identical. So four or five, species, I think there's 11 in one complex in the northern hemisphere. They have broadly, they look identical. There's no way that you can tell them apart using just morphology alone. So what you have to then do is look at the DNA. So what we would do then is we would take the, the mosquito, extract its DNA, then there's little sections of DNA which have been well studied across many, many different taxa or organisms. And because we know how to make those little structures amplify up uh, using different reactions as a polymerase chain reaction, um, we can make many, many copies of that and then sequence that. So we can then read that DNA 
And that DNA can then be compared against databases online and we can then see, okay, does this DNA fit with what's already known or is it something that's completely new? And with a lot of the Anopheles species, it's much easier and we, we can tell the species apart with that. And there's something about this larvae that I've, I meant to say that I love these little Anopheles larvae because although they're sitting at the surface like that, its head is facing the normal orientation, as you can see from that picture. But for them to feed, they feed from the surface of the water. So what they can do is they can rotate their head 180 degrees and they could feed from the surface of the water doing that. So their heads just rotate around. It's quite fascinating. What like an owl. Yeah, exactly. So on the subject of, um, of mosquito genetics, we've had a question from Lisa on Facebook who's um, asking about uh, that. So she's heard about kind of genetically modified mosquitoes that have been uh, created to try and kind of control mosquito populations when released into the wild. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? So there was a study done in Brazil a few years ago, which they tested this on, and now I think it's being introduced into Florida. Um, it's a case that they've got um, mosquitoes that they've developed it so that the males have got a specific gene that when they're developing, uh, they produce sterile, uh, uh, they produce sterile offspring. So when they mate with the female, the eggs then don't develop beyond a certain point, or at least they don't develop. I haven't read about it recently, although I know it's, it's going on, but uh, it basically halts development at some point. And the idea is that if the males mate with the females that are but normal, non-genetically modified, then that are already living in the environment, then they produce fewer eggs, and so that there are fewer mosquitoes then that could then potentially transmit the diseases later on. So that's, I think it's a good thing. Because there are often concerns when uh, releasing uh, genetically modified organisms or uh, and using any kind of what we call biocontrol methods. Um, in the past, you know, uh, even without genetic modification, we released, we used, uh, like for example, cane toads in Australia. They became a massive pest problem. Um, so do you think there's any, any risk associated with releasing organisms uh, into an environment in a bid to control that ecosystem? I think we always have to take account of that. And I think that way that people who are doing these things have got to be very, very careful when they're doing them. They're only targeting one species of mosquito, Aedes aegypti, or Stegomyia aegypti, depending on your preference of naming. Um, that was an introduced species into America. So it wasn't yeah. native to there. So it's good that it goes. And it's also a very significant disease vector. So it's really not good that it's there just now. So if they aren't sure, which I'm sure they are, that it's the right species that they're releasing, then I think it's okay. I think if they're, this is why it's really important that we actually understand the mosquitoes, because if we were to accidentally put a wrong mosquito out, then that might have problematic effects for harmless species. So you might be then targeting the wrong species. But in this case, it's a very, very well studied species. And so I don't think there's a problem here. I think uh, it's, it's a good idea because it's a problem species. Because I think this, this also feeds into a question that we've had from Periscope asking uh, what role do mosquitoes, what, what kind of niches do they fulfill in the ecosystems that they inhabit? So, I mean, for a start, if you look at some places where mosquitoes are found, they are in huge, huge, huge numbers. I mean, ri ridiculous numbers. So they provide a lot of food, not just as adults, but as larvae too, for developing organisms in, in water and also flying creatures in the air. But um, there's some species of mosquitoes which are known to be pollinators. So uh, Clarotasis nigropes is to be known to be a pollinator of a certain orchid in Alaska. And there's, there's various different things which are documented like that. So they have pollination effects and also the providing food mainly. But generally, species have filled, uh, they've evolved to fill some sort of environmental niche. Otherwise, they wouldn't have evolved in the first place. So, <laughs> so they have many different functions, I'm sure some of which we don't necessarily know about. So we've looked at um, how we can use uh, both morphology and genetics to tell different species apart and stuff. How does this feed into your work? So when you're you know, doing your research for your PhD? Yeah, so my research is, uh, is quite uh, broad, I would say. So the, I would say I have to collect mosquitoes as a basic point. And that's what you can see here. There's a picture of me collecting mosquitoes from a ditch at the side of a road. Um, and you can see that there is a sauna scoop there, very well used sauna scoop, which I found to be very useful that I can uh, I can uh, collect mosquitoes from inside ditches. So I live, I live in Finland now doing this. So saunas are ten a penny here. So these are everywhere. They're brilliant. Um, 
and I have a rather old but very well worn mosquito aquarium net, which are also very useful. So aquarium nets, although this one is possibly requiring some uh, attention after the summer season. But um, these are very, very good to get mosquito larvae out of the ground. Also turkey baster, I, I have one, but it's a bit too far away to grab. Uh, turkey basters are great to get things out of tree holes. So I collect mosquito larvae like that, but I also collect adults as well. Um, so yeah, so here we've got some oh, yeah, more larvae. Yeah. Collecting more larvae. So this is an example of the kind of diversity of, of places you can find them. You, you know, picking them out of a tire, out of the side of a tree. Yeah, so, so the some things you the, use to catch adults. Yeah, so the, the tires, I think I heard that uh, there's no orientation that you can store a tire in which it won't collect rainwater in some cases. And so there's many different species of mosquitoes that can take advantage of that and they can grow very quickly in there. So you can see that that would be a potentially a nutrient low uh, place to grow and that's why we would need protein then later on. Um, the picture on the right is of a primary forest, was it the edge of a primary forest in uh, Kenya a couple of years ago. Um, and that tiny little hole that's next to my hat is a tree hole and I was collecting mosquito out of that. And you can see from both of them though that the water is very, very dark. So in these cases, there's a lot of organic matter in that water. So it can be sometimes very, very difficult to see the larvae. And actually that's why we have a white container to, to, to put them in because then eventually when the water settles, you can see them contrasting against the bottom of the container. But uh, not just these, you can also find them in rice paddies I've been collecting in China and huge, and also in the Camargue in the south of France and the rice paddies, uh, they're very, very numerous there. You can find them next to streams. I mean, in the north, we've got uh, the, lots and lots of pools in the tundra. And there's, there's loads of places up there where we find them. So really, where there's water, there's mosquitoes. And you don't just look for larvae, you're also looking for adults as well. And, and obviously you need totally different methods to collect those as they're flying around, they're not just sitting in one place. So what are these weird and looking machines? Yeah, so there's a couple of different strategies that we have. There's lots of different traps. So these two are examples of passive traps, which we can just put in the environment and let them do their thing and come back later and see what mosquitoes have been attracted to them. So on the left, we've got a mosquito magnet that has got a can of propane which then feeds through into the main body of the trap. And in the bottom of the trap, there is a chemical attractant, which mimics all of the compounds that I said that we have in our skin and all that we're giving off. So the mosquitoes are really attracted to that. That's like having a really, really good smell for the mosquitoes to come to. <coughs> and the propane is converted into pulses of carbon dioxide and also heat. So that is those three things that the mosquito is attracted to in one trap right there. And it can be very, very effective at uh, attracting mosquitoes from a football field away or, or sometimes more sometimes less depending on how it's positioned and it's clever it because it to be pulses of carbon dioxide rather than a continuous stream because i guess that, that's how we breathe out that's how they're looking for their host yeah that's exactly it so there's been experiments done to show that if you just have a continuous stream of carbon dioxide mosquitoes ignore it they're not interested in it at all they're actually specifically interested in the pulses because that mimics the breathing of a vertebrate that they would be interested in in trying to feed from so it's a really clever and, and effective trap for mosquitoes. Next to it, we have a light trap, which can be effective as well, but it's less so than the other one. It's different uh, traps for different environments. So this one can be hoisted really high up in trees to get mosquitoes that don't really come down to the ground very much, which is good. But it all could, also can be just used a couple of meters <coughs> off the ground. And it uses light and the mosquitoes are attracted to the light. And sometimes I attach dry ice onto the trap and that dry ice then gives off carbon dioxide, which attracts the mosquitoes. So they come in, and there's a fan and then that sucks them in and then they get trapped in the bag at the bottom. So I can then collect them later. So those are the those are two of the passive ways that we have to collect them. But an active way is using a Proco pack. Now I have my Proco pack right here. So this is, I get the orientation right, uh, a handheld uh, mosquito aspirator. So it's like a hoover for mosquitoes, but although it looks a bit like a hairdryer. So here we've got a cup and in the bottom of this cup, we have got uh, a metal mesh so you can see it's, it's empty on the end we pop that in there with the lid off and then once we turn it on which i can't do just now because it's not attached uh the mosquitoes are which are either flying around and bothering me while i'm collecting can just be hoovered off me and i have to say it's really lovely when there's a huge amount of mosquitoes <laughs> and i'm collecting larvae just to hoover them off um or we can ta target them by adding a pole on the bottom of here and we can use it to then survey around animal shelters so we can get a lot more things here so once we're done we put a a cup on the end, the lid on the end of the cup, and turn it off very quickly so we don't burn the motor out, and then take it out, and then our mosquitoes are trapped inside the cup. So then we can do the, with them whatever we need to later on. So that's a great little active method of 
of catching mosquitoes. So that's also a good way of getting males because we can get them off vegetation that happens to be where the males tend to rest. And that photo on the right, I guess, it's showing that uh, you, know, you can find mosquitoes in all sorts of places. You know, we yeah, might yeah. find them, you know, in a in a house in Kenya on the left, um, but on a snowy mountain. Yeah, so this was a few years ago in very north of Finland, one of the I think a few mountains that Finland actually has, and um, it was my field assistant that was helping me. And um, I think I worked him too hard that day, and he was in protest. But um, the, we were collecting mosquitoes. I don't think we collected them quite that high up because that was where the larvae were. But further down the slopes, there were definitely mosquitoes active, and we were collecting them that day because there are species which are adapted to the cold climates, and they can do very, very well in these cold climates. So they also have tropical species too. But uh, yeah, in the north, there are many, many species up here. So what do we do? What do you what do you do once you've collected these larvae and adults? So with the larvae, what we would do is we'll, we've got them. We've collected them from our scoops and we put them into a container to then bring them back to the lab. And then I have got uh, boxes and boxes and boxes, much like this. Each one has got lots and lots of tubes inside. I had two different types of tubes. So I have got, this is very difficult to see, but uh, if I do it like that, you can see there's a little wiggling mosquito larvae inside there. That's a little mosquito, a Clotetis caspius, which is squiggling around just now. So he'll stay in there for as long as development takes. And then I feed them on powdered baby fish food, so they get that. And then at some point, they will start pupating. This is a curacito, although it's in a poor container. The pupa is a different shape, and he will just sit at the surface of the water quite happily for a while. But in the process of, of, of developing, the larva leaves behind a skin. So that's why this tube is here. So I've got a tube of alcohol here, and that's got the larval skin inside. And so that means that I've got the record of the larval stage and of the pupal stage. Now, hopefully, if all goes well, the mosquito will then continue its development and I will it'll emerge into an adult. And I put it into a dry tube where it can stay. Now, if I put it there, you can see there's a female mosquito. Oh, it's hard to do this. Uh, on the bottom of the tube there, and she can stay in there for 24 hours to make sure that her exoskeleton hardens before I deal with her anymore. So yes, uh, that means that I've got there's an Anopheles mosquito here, but I think this one's much harder to see. She's hiding the lid here. Um, but uh, the, this means that I've got a link with specimen. So I've got that record of the larval stage, and I've got the record of the pupil stage, and I have the adult. So then I would use these for either pinning, so that we have those uh, the things that you traditionally see with the entomology drawers, that you open them up and there's mosquitoes inside, so we can pin them and then we can view them under the microscope on a point. Um, or I can then put them in a tube ready for DNA extraction at a later point. And so I've got this wonderful uh, extra information with that one specimen with those skins. And yeah, I guess uh, what, what kind of conclusions and patterns can you draw from having all of these, uh, these different life stages? Well, I think for some species, not, not the northern species, but for some species, the life stages are not known. So we might only know a species from a larva and not the adult. Um, so it gives you information to then try and work out which species you have in the environment. It's very, very important to know variation in a species so that we can say that, okay, we think we have species X, but actually species X has overlapped with species Y, and so be careful. So putting a name on a specimen is very, very important, especially because these many of these species can transmit diseases. So we need to understand as much of them as we can. Um, uh, yeah, so that, that's, that's really it. It's, it's making sure that we have that extra information. We don't know what's going to happen in terms of species moving around in the next, you know, however many years, uh, be it the short or long term. So it's also very important to understand a lot about these species. And, and you've worked in all sorts of countries around the world, haven't you? Um, you know, currently you're working in Finland, but you've worked in Africa, in Asia. Um, so what can you tell us about some of your kind of adventures? Yeah, I've been really, really lucky and I've, I'm really grateful for the job that I have. I love it very much. Um, I was asked, this is a picture of a group of us who went to uh, Democratic Republic of Congo back in 2012. I was asked to go along. Uh, there was uh, two museum scientists, uh, well, three, including myself, two others. And then there was some other researchers from across Europe. And then there's some locals as well that were pictured here. We were basically trying to improve the collections for the museum. So I was asked to go along and try and increase the mosquito uh, the mosquito collection for the museum and so i was doing much as i, I explained there the, the larval rearing because we get more information about the specimens that way 
but I was also helping collect moths and beetles and all sorts of other things as well. Um, it's very important to understand the environment and it was, it was great fun actually. Um, but there was some unexpected parts. So when we were driving to the, to the field station, the Yangambi Reserve, we had to cross the Congo River and it's the Congo that's in the background of this photograph. So we were on the other bank and we had to cross over. Then we had to drive for a long, long distance across this, uh, alongside the river. And we got to a point where a bridge had collapsed. You can see the metal parts of the bridge in the water here. And the enterprising locals had taken four dugout canoes and used the timbers from the bridge, strapped them across. And so they had a barge, which then they had one guy on each side pulling with a rope. So then we had such a palaver trying to get two four by fours across this river, one at a time, with some poor guys having to pull this thing across. <laughs> But yeah, you get to see some quite odd things when you're doing field work. But it's a lot of work and it's it's long days. And but it, I love it; it's great fun. I'm a workaholic, so it, it suits me. And you know, it's funny. I guess this goes to illustrate how kind of scientific research doesn't. You know, it's not always just kind of clean white rooms with lab coats and and kind of, uh, shiny machines. It's also you know trying to find a way to get across a river using some old canoes and a broken bridge. Yeah, absolutely. I think you have to have a very good ability to problem solve when you're doing field work, especially in remote places like this. I've done remote field work in China and Kenya and, and Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo. And I think it, it's always good to have one eye in how do you fix things? Because when you go, when these things go wrong in these countries, there's really no way to just nip to a shop and buy a replacement for something. You have to think on your feet and, and be able to cope with that. It's fun. It's challenging sometimes, but it could be fun. Um, we've had a question from Susan uh, on Facebook who's asking about your work in Finland, um, which I think we've got some a slide for. So I'm based at Helsinki University, although I live slightly north of there. Um, I have been doing collections across Finland. So this is a map of Finland. You can see it's in the northern uh, hemisphere. It's, it's north of Europe, borders with Sweden, Norway and Russia. And it, below, there's a, Estonia is below, but not connected by land. Um, I have been collecting mosquitoes from around the whole country. So I've managed to get some uh, research grants and they've managed to go around. And each one of these red dots signifies a place where one or more mosquitoes has been collected. This is only up until the end of 2017. So actually, because of the coronavirus, I've not been able to go into the lab this year as much as I would have hoped to have done. So instead, we have settled on the fact I do a little bit more field work to strengthen my DNA project. So I've, my, that's just going to be a, a more comprehensive study now. But uh, yeah, so I've, I've I've been doing stuff so much that I actually think I know Finland better than I know the UK now, though, <laughs> which is probably bad for me to say. <laughs> well, being from London myself, my geography of the UK is pretty bad anyway. Well, I'm from the north, so I should have a better knowledge. <laughs> but um, but no, so my, my these are where I've collected mosquitoes from. So some of these would be larval collections, as I've explained, and some of them are adult collections. And some of those adult collections will be used again for pinning and being used in a museum collection for reference. That's great for being able to say what variation there is between the same species or between different species. Um, but also, we, sorry, also I have um, some of these species that are specimens that I've been collecting will go through for virus studies. So we're trying to figure out uh, which viruses the mosquitoes in that have? Are they important for humans? Are they important for other species? Uh, where are they found? And what I'm, I, what I'm ultimately doing with this, and my paper's just been accepted a couple of weeks ago, is producing one map per species of this 43 species of Finland, uh, mosquitoes in Finland. And that should hopefully provide a starting point for anybody working in the future in this area to say that we know that at this time point, these mosquitoes were in these places. And if a virus or, or other pathogen comes along, we can say that, okay, this is the starting data and we can extrapolate out from that to see where might this species be found if targeted control needs to be done. And I, I guess uh, this is really important because at the moment, you know, we've got the whole kind of climate change problem. And so things are changing in ecosystems all over the world. So are we seeing changes in the patterns and prevalence of different species of mosquito? Well, there's some data from the 1970s, uh, published in 79, that we can compare against my study. Um, but there's fewer specimens included in that study and the methods aren't described properly. So I can't compare my data to their study and say that, that we definitely have new distribution data. It's just that they might not have collected in areas where I have, or they might have collected at the wrong time of the year because some species are only active within certain windows. Or, you know, if you collect as an adult mosquitoes only, then you're going to miss the larvae and often they're different species that are prevent, present at the same time. So we can't compare it directly, but 
I think what we can say is that as climate is warming, and it is warming, um, the season for mosquitoes, especially in the north, is getting longer. And so what that could do if it continues is we've got a longer time window in which mosquitoes can be active, which means potentially that they have more generations of mosquitoes per year, which means that any viruses that are being transmitted have a bigger window in which that they can be transmitted. And that's important. We don't we don't necessarily want that. But maybe we can't control it anyway, but at the moment. But but um, as well as that, what we can find is that if the habitat uh, changes due to climate change because it's warmer or, or, or so forth, mosquitoes can change their distributions as well. And we think that there's some species moving further north. But certainly my data shows a lot more north than uh, species further north than they were in the 70s. But like I said, I can't can definitely say that this is climate change or anything else. It's just that we're seeing that happen. Um, but it does allow species to move further north. And, that might not necessarily be a problem within Finland, but if you've got species from other countries that are not yet present in Finland, they could theoretically move up as well, or into Sweden or into Norway or into Russia as well. And they could then become a problem later. So we don't want these invasive species coming in if possible. And so I think we can maybe close up with a couple of final questions. So we're getting towards the end of the show. Um, and we've had some questions that relate to mosquitoes in the UK. Um, so uh, Jackie has asked on Facebook, how many types of mosquito are there present in the UK? And, and is that changing? Do you know, it's terrible. I meant to check on that before I came on here and I completely yeah. forgot, but because it's not my group anymore. But I think there's fewer in, fin in the UK than there are in Finland. So in Finland, there are 43. I think it's around about late 30s in the UK. I, I, I feel really embarrassed that I forgot to check that now. I think it was about 36, but don't quote me on that. But it's around that number somewhere. Um, and uh, Maria is asking, uh, so she's got water fountains uh, in her little balcony garden. Um, and she's wondering if there's anything that she can put in there, whether it's um, a chemical or, or another creature that could prevent mosquito larvae from living in there. That's not my forte, but I would say that it's 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 very difficult. I think depending on where you are. Larvae or? Well, yeah, there's other things that would eat the larvae. Dragonfly larvae are fantastic predators, and they will definitely eat mosquito larvae, but I don't think it's going to be so easy to populate a fountain with dragonfly larvae. There are many <laughs> different creatures that will eat them. Um, I would say that if there's algae buildup on the fountains, then that's going to be providing food for mosquitoes. So if there's less algae, then that's better. But then I guess it depends if you want to have other creatures in that fountain or not as well, because you don't want to exclude other things from being in. What you could do... Uh, it would be a bit laborious, but it would be possible is to go along to your fountain and scoop them out. Because if you throw the water away, the mosquitoes will die because uh, as soon as they're out of water, the larvae can't survive. They dry up. So it's a, that's one way of getting rid of them once they're there. Chemical wise, I think you would have to ask somebody who's specialized in that because that's not my range. That's not my field at all. So dragonfly larvae, lots of creatures that eat them or scoop them out of the net. That's Probably one way. I mean... That's almost so, if you've got kids, they're a great way of um, introducing mosquitoes to kids is to show them the larvae, because I can remember when I was a kid looking at the water barrel at the side of the house and seeing these wiggly things inside and wondering what on earth they were. And now I know what they were, but I didn't know what they were at the time. So it's uh, if you really want to, you can also put them in a jam jar and just watch them develop through to being adults. So it's a nice little biology experiment at home. Yeah, you can either, you can either try and get rid of them or you can use them as a teaching tool. Uh, How else do you get interested in the natural world unless you learn about these things when you're little? Right. Okay, so I think we're going to wrap up with one final question from Sally, who's asked, uh, so she says, uh, if I'm interested in studying uh, disease in the future, would you recommend doing um, st studying insect ecology or mammalian biology or uh, microbiology? What sort of things uh, do you think would be handy for studying disease vectors and spread? Well, I think disease is an enormous term that covers lots and lots of different things. So I think if you're truly studying diseases, then a medical degree is better. But if you're interested in the mosquito side of things, then it would definitely be interesting to then study a mosquito related course or an insect related course. There's uh, courses at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, if I remember rightly, there's master's degree courses on various uh, various subjects related to this. Although that's stretching my mind a bit, but there certainly were a few years ago. Um, yeah. but, From the total other end of things, I studied immunology, so I studied the immune system, how the host reacts to disease. Um, so there are all sorts of different angles that you can come at it if you want to study how diseases and hosts interact. 
Absolutely. I mean, my background is a zoology degree as a bachelor's degree, and then I did a taxonomy degree as a master's degree. And then I come into this having done the job with mosquitoes before starting my PhD. So I think there are many ways that you can you can get into it. I think it's just got to have that passion and have that focus to try and make it happen. So. Well, I think that's a lovely place to wrap it up. Thank you so much, Lorna. Well, thank really... you very much for having me. I never knew there were so many interesting things to know about mosquitoes. They're fascinating creatures. Thank you so much. And thank you at home for joining us today as well. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Please do join us again for more Nature Live shows on, 12, uh, on Tuesdays at 12 and on Fridays at 10.30. Keep an eye on our social media channels for more information. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube and nhm.ac.uk. Until next time, that was Lorna Coverwell, I'm Khalil Dalloway and this has been Nature Live Online. We're really looking forward to seeing you at the museum again soon. Goodbye.